Okay, welcome back, everyone. Today I am with Troy Lambert as the author, not as the plotter ambassador. So hi, Troy, how are you doing? <laughs> Fantastic. How are you doing? Good. I'm excited to talk to you today because you wear two different hats. We've had you on two different times, but this time we get to see your face, not the plotter logo. So you are Troy Lambert, mystery and thriller author, correct? Correct. Yes. Right. Among other things, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> we'll stick with that for we'll now. We'll stick with that one right now. <laughs> we won't ask your wife <laughs> what she'll add to that. <laughs> um, so Tell us a little bit about how you got into writing. Um, so so I, I'm one of those people that always wanted to be a writer. Like I wrote books. I wrote my first book when I was like six. Okay. When I was like 14 in high school, I told all my high school counselors and everybody that I wanted to be a writer. Um, and they all, because they were very smart, told me that that was an impossible dream, <laughs> that there was nothing that I, that wasn't there. Like you write good stories, you're creative, but you need to have, find a way to make money. Um, and which that's a whole road we could go down. But anyway, right. so I, so essentially I tell people I wasted, I believed them. And so I yeah. went out and tried to find various careers. I went to college for various different things. Um, and, you know, three, 30 years later, you know, at the end of a string of hairnets and name tags and various careers, I basically went, I should probably figure out this writing thing because yeah. otherwise I'm not sure what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. Like I wasn't a, you know, I wasn't always a great employee because doing things I was told rather than something creative didn't really work well <laughs> for me. Um, and neither did that work for my employers. Um, although there, there are a few exceptions to that. And I had I actually had some great experiences that, that helped me in my writing later. Mm. Um, but all of that to be said, that's how I got into it. Well, when I decided that it was around the 2009 time period okay. and indie publishing was becoming a thing that was a little less dirty, we'll just yeah. say. You know? yes. I mean, it was like it was like before that, if you self-published, you were the pariah. But I mean, I, at that point, you know, Mark Coker had started Smashwords. KDP was on the rise. So people were realizing there is another path to publication other than yes. traditional publishing. And there were a lot of small presses at that time that emerged kind of taking advantage of kind of a digital first type publishing model mm -hmm. and that type of trend. Um, so it was a good time for me to make that decision. Um, obviously, there have been a few changes since I was <laughs> since I started doing that. The industry has Unfortunately. changed just, <laughs> just a little. Well, unfortunately or fortunately, it depends on how you look at your business and the business of publishing. So I immediately went to the default mode because I'd had all those jobs. So one thing mm. that they taught me was I had a certain amount of business skills and business savvy because Which I had good. to, yeah. to go through all those jobs. So when I approached writing, it was very much from not only a passion standpoint, but an economic standpoint. Okay. Like how can I sell books and make this work? Because Was it to like quit the job? Like, can oh, I do well, this to yeah, I mean, the, the biggest thing was basically to to not have a day job, if at all okay. possible, um, which for the most part, since then, I've not really had a day job. Like I've had a couple of part time things or whatever that I did temporarily. Um, but for the most part, my day job has been writing. Wait, um, did you quit before you became like published? No, there was a transition. There <laughs> Because a lot of so, people will like wait, right? They'll be like, but, they'll they'll straddle that for a yeah, while. Yeah, so I straddled for a while, but part of that was I was working a day job where basically my job was to write. Now okay. there were other aspects of that job, but one of my jobs was to write because um, I worked. I got involved in the museum world basically, and we had we were in northern Idaho, and we had the EPA approach us, and they were like, we have all these. Um, mine sites that we need to survey and we need tons of information from them and the museum where I worked at had tons of the historical records from those mine sites and I knew where the rest of those records were because part of my background is like even when I was a kid like I'm a researcher right like okay. you give me a topic and I get a hold of it like a bulldog with a bone and I'm not letting go until I get the answer right um, which is good for a mystery writer. Um, yeah, I was just going to say. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes it could be very distracting, but for the most part, it's a, it's a good thing, right? Um, and so what I discovered was I was like, we have all this information. I know how to write. And so there's probably a way we can leverage this for the museum and for me 
Um, so I wrote a job description for a head of the research department and a what was called a museum operations specialist for the museum. Oddly, it lined up almost identically with my own resume. Um, <laughs> hmm, <imagine> so, <laughs> really strange how that worked. So, so basically, then I eased, I basically moved into that role. Um, and what it taught me, the beauty of working freelance or doing journalism or things like that for a writer is, first of all, you're going to learn to write tight and to a deadline. Okay. Yeah. Right? You're, you're going to have word count, you're going to have, but you're going to have deadlines. I mean, and the deadlines are hard deadlines. You miss the deadline, you don't get paid. Right. Yeah, so yeah. for many of us, that's a great motive. And technically, even if you're writing fiction yourself, if you don't finish the book, you don't, get, you don't paid. get paid. So it teaches you that mentality. Um, it also taught me that my words were actually worth money. Like yeah. the, uh, your tax dollars were paying me to write words. That was right. pretty cool. Right. But I also found that writing was a skill. As many times as writers, people think of this as like, this is a hobby or this is a passion thing or whatever the case may be. But I found that my writing was actually a skill. And there were people that I, were around me that had master's degrees and four million letters after their name, right? But they couldn't write. Yeah. Like they couldn't have written one of those reports. I could have given them all the same information I had, all the same tools, everything else. And they couldn't have written those reports. Right. But I could. And so it taught me that that skill was unique and that I could make money doing that. And so for me, that was a huge, that was the biggest lesson out of that whole thing. So that mentality and that inspiration enabled me to shift from working for someone to thinking about working for myself and how I could leverage this for myself. That's really so, great. I mean, I, yeah. I look at a lot of writers um, and we all have to sort of have our own journey, right? But if you haven't been out in the world and done that deadline thing and the figuring out something for your boss thing, you know, that's kind of going to be a bit detrimental when you're all alone in your office or wherever you write and no one's there to say anything except for you, you know, like yep. you, it, it, I find it a struggle for a lot of people. Um, so even like young people who ask me like, no, I'm just going to try to do it now. Like whatever entrepreneurial thing they do, I'm almost like, yeah, but you should probably do it at the same time because it's just skills that you'll find. Um, I was mm -hmm. talking to one the other day, a writer, I was like, it's funny because you almost feel more productive when you are working two jobs because your brain is working on two different levels. Whereas like you wake up as a full time writer and you feel like you have the whole day until it's eight o'clock at night and you're like, wait a minute, what happened to the day? You know, so these are really valuable skills of learning the deadline, learning to write tightly, right? Learning to research within a certain amount of time, all within your day job. And then I'm sure you wanted to go home and write. It's like your brain is just constantly active instead of sort of like yeah. all the time in the world. <laughs> well, and also the other thing is that, so, if you let's say you come out of your writing program, let's say you went to college for writing, which most of the time for people is a terrible idea. Yes. Um, <laughs> You've got lots uh, of rules in your head. <laughs> the reason that and it's not even necessarily the rules. The reason is they teach you to write beautiful prose, but they tell you nothing about the publishing industry and how to actually make this work. Or a story. So you like, walk out into story? the real world and you're like, okay, what yeah. now? Like what yeah. next? Right? There's nothing. You have no background. The other thing is that you learn a lot by just being with people mm. that are smarter than you. Um, and and there, there's just an incredible value to that, that you that yeah. it, it, it's really difficult to explain because that person is going to have some nugget that maybe inspires your story, but maybe if nothing else gives you a business idea that says, hey, this is this is something that you should do. Right. So coming out and just being going straight into the entrepreneurship part of things is, first of all, is super challenging in today's yeah. market because you need some background, you need some information. And people constantly underestimate the amount of education it takes to be a writer full time. Right. What I mean by that is going back to that doesn't mean you need a college degree. 
But what it means is you need to be immersed and, and constantly working on your craft and improving the craft of writing because you're never going to master it. You're forever going to write horrible first drafts. They might not be as horrible as you go forward, but they're still going to be bad first drafts. But there is so much more to it, regardless of your path to publication, whether that's traditional, whether you do self-publishing, whether you're like me and you do some kind of hybrid type thing, whatever the case may be, there you still have to have a very thorough understanding and knowledge of the publishing industry. And it's constantly changing. So you have to keep up. Right. So there, there are no, like, there's not an alternative. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, you yeah. need to be constantly educating, your, educating yourself. That means conferences. That means hanging out with people in mastermind groups that are your peers or above, preferably. Mm -hmm. um, there, there is a place for you to mentor younger writers. And that is like this year, I'm the president of Idaho Writers Guild. I'm giving back to the community, mentoring other writers, mentoring other people and helping run an organization that helps them. Right. Yeah. But that's but great. That is not you're, my. You're, yeah. Yeah. You're, and so you're thinking as you're teaching, right, but that's right. not my. I also need those groups that are my peers yeah. and above that challenge me exactly. and say, hey, this is what you're doing, but this is how you could go to the yeah. next level. Because there's always a next level, always yeah. next level. Yeah, you never want to be the smartest person in the room all the time, you know, and I smartest yeah. in that you know the most about that one topic. You know, teaching, mm -hmm. of course, reiterates, you know, one of my um, writers the other day asked me a question that I said, that's a very good question. <laughs> let me go, let me go oh. figure that out, you know? Um, but I want to go back to the, like you, you said skill a couple of minutes ago. And I think that what some writers um, miss, especially if it has been a passion since they were a kid and they do have a talent for storytelling for seeing stories for in the world and in their minds, a lot, I've come across quite a few especially young writers who don't think they need anything other than their talent. Mm -hmm. And I always try to very gently say, yes, you do. So you've said skill quite a bit. And you said that you have to be honing your craft. So what, what does that mean to you and for, for when you're working with writers? So I use, I usually use the analogy of sports or like some kind of a game, right? You can have an innate talent. Let's say I have an innate talent for basketball, right? But if I don't ever go practice the fundamentals, if I always just have a talent for it, I might be an okay player on the mm. playground, but I'm never going to make it to the NBA. Okay. You know what I mean? Because I'm right. never going to learn those fine skills and to, because you can see the difference. Go and watch your local high school basketball game. Then go and watch a professional basketball game. The other night, my wife and I went and saw our local hockey team here, right? Which is, they're very good in their league. But they have, like, missed passes that you know if it was NHL, somebody would score because right. somebody missed that pass. Okay. But it doesn't happen in the lower leagues because that missed pass is okay, right? Right. So as a writer, what happens is you you there's a progression, that you have craft wise and business knowledge, right? Where you go from being a hobbyist and an amateur to kind of a pro-am. You're kind of in the middle. You're making a little money off your writing. You're not making a living off of it yet. And some of the reason for that has to do with that honing your craft. Mm -hmm. um, that fact of understanding that each story has a trajectory and has a path and that there are reader expectations and that you need to, basically your reader is your customer in some ways, and you need to reach that readers and meet their expectations. So at the end of the book, they're satisfied. But as a writer, it's about more than that. Because today, for you to gather a bunch of readers, you also need a relationship mm -hmm. and an emotional connection with those readers. So you're never going to get that from an AI generated book for example, <laughs> to bring up the elephant in the room that everybody's yes. talking about, that there's like two major announcements about today, everybody's right? Everybody's freaking out about it. Yeah. Everybody's freaking out about that. But the, the couple things that that um, AI cannot do is, first of all, intent is the number one. Like you sit down to write a story, you have intent, right? The AI has no intent. They do It does what you tell it to do, right? right? The second thing is it's putting words in certain orders logically based on what it has learned. It's not doing them emotionally. And when you ask it for a twist, the twist doesn't always make sense. 
Yes. Why? <laughs> because the AI doesn't understand story the way you should understand story, right? So that the ability to create that special twist at the end of your book that really hooks your reader and it also changes them emotionally is a skill that you must right. learn. And the longer you do this, the more proficient you become at that skill, provided that you are actually analyzing what you are doing. Yes. If you are just writing lots of stories over and over again, a friend of mine started, she's a great writer now, and she's in her 30s, which is fantastic because a lot of writers don't come on into their own until their 40s, right? Right, right. But part of that is she started writing fanfic online when she was 12. Wow. And has written her. millions of words yeah. online. But also at the same time, she studied craft. Right. She studied people along the way. So she has an amazing following for fan fiction, actually. And the reason is her stories are actually good. Right. Because she refined them over time. So the, this, it, this is a skills development career. You must develop skills along the way. Yes. You, yes. you can have talent, and talent is very helpful. But I know some writers who have less talent than others, but greater skill and those writers are making more money and making a living at it. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm trying to get across to some of writers that I talk to is like, I think a lot of the talent is in your head. And what, what is very frustrating to writers sometimes is getting it from your head to the paper is a really different process. Like I was just writing this morning and I was like, I had this whole conversation in my head in the car Two minutes later, I'm at my computer and it's different, <laughs> you know, like there's mm -hmm. something missing. So I'll have to put my finger on that later, but that's the frustrating part. And that's where your skill comes in, right? Because you're going to, you know, like you said, get your rough draft out there. It's down, it's on the paper. And I know there's something wrong, but I know there's something wrong because I've studied the craft of it and being able to say, okay, there was a twist there and here and, and twists, like you said, you you mentioned twists and those aren't just for mystery thriller writers right like a mm -hmm. twist it's for everything is for every yeah. book right so what do you mean when when you're talking about a twist like why would a women's uh, fiction writer still need a twist in their in their story well a lot of that is so so there's a couple different phrases that we toss around this is part of your skill as a writer is learning the vocabulary and a part of it is like the, at the end of each chapter that you create should be a hook mm. right and the purpose of the hook is one thing to get the reader to turn the page to the next chapter now you're also going to use micro hooks throughout your book right um but the reason we need a twist is because life is twist right what a twist does for you really is and and the reason it works in women's fiction and other fiction as well is a twist is not about the events that happen and this is a common mistake that writers make right. is they think a clever twist is about throwing in a new suspect or throwing in a new thing. And no, a twist is about changing the emotion of the story and changing your character arc. Mm. So the character was thinking one way. The reason we talk about the midpoint in a story is the character was thinking one way. And for most of the time, the first half of a book, the character is reacting to things that happen to them. Mm -hmm. Right. The midpoint and that twist and that change in the story is when the character is no longer reacting and now they are taking action. They become right. proactive. Right. Basic writing type things. But for them to switch, to make that switch, something needs to happen. Right. And usually that is some kind of a twist. Their expectations were wrong. They discover that they're actually something different. Um, they thought that they needed something or that they wanted something and they get to the middle of the book and they discover that's not actually what they need. Right. It's not actually what they want. And that's the twist. And all that does is it turns your character around and makes them turn and face a different direction. Mm -hmm. And usually that also makes your antagonist face a different direction. They were pursuing now they are being pursued and this this works in romance as well if you like romance your one of your romantic interests is the lead the other one is actually the antagonist 
usually. That's the right. antagonist in your story, right? And that's what creates that tension. And the twist is when the one that was the lead and was, you know, resisting or whatever the case may be, that flips. Right. And now they're pursuing, right? And every you can see it in romance as you watch them. You can see it happen. Right. Um, my wife and I just watched the, it's kind of a romantic comedy, You People, that's on netflix or something There's last so night and i thought <laughs> i thought this is this is a classic romancing the beat four phase mm -hmm. plot I, as i was going through it i could see each of those things happening but it's satisfying as a, right as the viewer but it was oh yeah it was absolutely satisfying because even though i knew i'm like they're gonna break up right here <laughs> but at the same time i wanted to see how the writers made that happen and why right. that happened and because i was invested in the characters then i cared that yeah. that happened and i wondered how they would bring them back together after that yeah right yeah. so it's still even though i know what's coming and i know they're going to get back together but i want to know how i want to know why i yeah. want to know what their motive was for changing their mind after this huge radical change that caused them to split then what is the next radical change that causes them to get back together? Right, right? right. So I, I'm still vested in the story. I'm still vested in the characters, even though I know what's going to happen. So your characters, especially, are really in a large part what drives your story forward, and it's about the character twists, not the event twists. Right. That's. I mean. Yeah, it's not really like I think one of the greatest twists. Um, is the breakup with Jennifer Aniston and uh, he's a comedy actor. The dude, yeah, the I dude know who guy. You're talking about. Oh, we all yeah. know him, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I think that was one of the greatest twists, and that was before I was studying craft because it's really about him. Like you said, it's about the character, and it's about mm -hmm. him learning that it's not about keeping her; it's about loving her enough to let her go. And it's just like, it's such a good twist because it changes him in a small like the small realization and it changes how he treats every single person right and it's yep. like i use that as an example because we we tend to overthink things as writers you know like the want and the need and the whatever like he wants the girlfriend to stay but he's not he it's not in the for the right reasons you know and so that changes and I think we just get, we make it so complicated when we, when we're trying to like define what all these things are, we have to make it some philosophical <laughs> something. Yeah. Or other. Well, yeah, it has to be some kind of philosophical discussion. It doesn't have to be because it's really, it's like real life. Like real life is right. really simple. The only difference between fiction and real life is that fiction has to make sense yes. <laughs> and it has to end in a satisfying way. Um, real life doesn't always necessarily, like each chapter of your life doesn't always necessarily have to do that, right? right, right. Um, but one example I use is like Bohemian Rhapsody. Like my okay. wife and I went and saw that movie in the theater, right? Um, and the guy who plays Freddie Mercury, I can't remember his name either, but he's absolutely amazing, yeah. right? And there was a moment, you know how there's the normal just kind of rustling in the theater and the normal kind of chatter. And then there was a moment when he's, talking to the one girl i think it's elizabeth i can't remember her name but anyway and he, he's he's talking to her on the phone but he can see her window from the phone and it's a very emotional moment because you can tell that this is the moment when they really realize that this is not ever going to work he's right. not into her in that way and she wants something different than what he's yeah. offering yeah and he's on the phone but he can see her window and he says well Good night. And as he hangs up the phone, her light in her window goes dark. And the entire theater was silent. Yeah. Like dead silent for like a good 10 seconds. And it was like every person in the theater reacted the exact same way to mm -hmm. that moment. Now, if you knew the story, of his life if you know the story of queen and if you understand story structure you knew this was coming like this right. was not a shock right? right but it's still everyone held their breath for one moment because everyone hit that realization wall at the same 
time. Yeah. I mean, it's beautiful. It was a beautiful moment because you wouldn't have gotten that at home necessarily. When you're watching it in a theater, you see the reactions of yeah, everyone yeah. else too. But it was super amazing just to go, wow. Which is one of the reasons to go see some of these movies in a theater is not to necessarily see it on the big screen or to burn $20 on snacks <laughs> that are useless that you could have made at home for five. Um, but it's it's because you can feel and see experience the reactions right. of it with other people and see that crowd and see their reaction to things. Yeah. Um, it's a great way to study story because yes. you can see instead of a reader telling you how they reacted to something you can actually see it happen to someone yeah it's amazing you can feel it with others right what is landing with people and what's not because in the end i mean there's two different skills whether it's writing and you know cinematography but the storytelling um what works what what people like on rotten tomatoes and don't like it's all about the story you know is the mm -hmm. story hitting the beats that is satisfying to the to the reader right so but let's talk a little bit about your your books. Did you always start writing out mystery? And um, how much did you work at mystery skill writing before you actually just pushed it out there? <laughs> so, um, so when I was in college, I actually tried to write sci-fi. Because when okay. I was growing up, I read a lot of sci-fi and fantasy. Um, and that was a lot of my escape. But I also read a lot of mysteries. It's super... It, it's just like I was extremely well, like I've read everything I could get my hands on yeah. from the time I was really young, everything they would let me check out of the library. I would, there'd be sometimes I go to check something out and they're like, that's something that's, you know, you're not going to finish that. It's too complicated for somebody your age. And I'm like, no, it's not. Just give me the book. <laughs> um, you know, I read Black Beauty when I was in like fourth grade. I mean, you know, it's just, it's a, it, it was an amazing story. But anyway, um, but I read all of the Hardy Boys books, like all of them yeah, that were out at the time. I had all the, you know, the little hard <laughs> hardback ones. There were like 50 some at the time. I read all of those. Right. But I also read a lot of Isaac Asimov and stuff like that. And then I started to get into Stephen King and those type of things. So I didn't start out with the intent necessarily to write mystery and thriller. But what okay. I found was that that just ended up being my author voice. Okay. Like I tried other things and there are some of my stuff that has little paranormal elements in it or whatever. But what I found was, first of all, when I came down and I realized what my first novel was and what it needed to be, I was like, okay, this is a psychological thriller. That's exactly what it is. It's mental, okay. but it's, it's a thriller type thing. And There's a mystery when did you elements. Figure that out? Like while you're um, writing it or? Yeah. While I was writing, well, okay. the first thing, so when I first started out, the conventional wisdom was you release a collection of short stories so everyone can get used to your writing, and then you release your first novel. That's this right. Was just, that was this was thing. just a thing. It was yes. a thing. And everybody said, this is what you have to do. And I was like, I don't want to. And they were like, well, this is what you have to do anyway. So that, that was the conventional wisdom at the time, was this was how to get into indie publishing, which worked to an extent. But what I found was when I gathered up a lot of the short stories that I had, they all had that same similar, like, dark, kind of sinister, psychological, thriller, mystery type theme. They were all different. Like, one of them, I'm like, I'm rewriting. I took the story. I was going to put it in an anthology that I'm in with a person and then, with another gal. And then I was like, I need to rewrite this story because it doesn't make sense this way anymore, okay. um, the way it did before. But it's still the same story. Like there's a bank heist, it's a thriller, there's cops, there's bad guys, um, you know. And so as I started to put that together, I was like, okay, this is my thing, right? But then I, you know, wrote my first novel. And then I had, there was a friend of mine that owned a small press and he was like, I want you to submit some short stories. And this one has to be about dragons. Well, I submitted a short story about dragons and it's a thriller with dragons. I mean, it's, that's what it is. You know, you, you can't take it um, out of there. I actually wrote, um, so I was a, uh, I worked as an editor for a publisher for a long time and I was okay. the managing editor of a steamy romance series. So I wrote the first you book in a like steamy. the quintessential editor for a steamy romance. <laughs> right? I mean, pretty much, right? Well, I just, I would always tell people, you know, I have three kids. I've got it figured out. Okay, I know how, <laughs> I know how this works. happens. <laughs> I know how this works. It's all right. Um, but anyway, so I wrote the first 
steamy romance because I wanted it to be, I wanted that series to be a mix of there needed to be a plot. I'm like, I don't want your straight erotica. It was around the time that 50 Shades came out. So we were getting submissions of 50 I'm Shades of every color <laughs> that you could imagine. And I'm like, what in the, something's wrong with you people. <laughs> and people were trying to write erotica. I had no business writing erotica. There were things they were saying and words and, terminology and descriptions that i was like no 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 anyway so i was <laughs> like i want this to be split you know okay plot and romance heavy okay. romance so i wrote the first one in that series which is a mystery thriller steamy romance <laughs> i mean there's there's a murder there's a cop and his wife there's a dead body and lots of hot sex but i mean there's that's the the premise, the idea was still the yeah. same. Like there was yeah. still people that have read my fiction before will read that and they go, I can, that's your author voice right there. Yeah. You know? And so the more I discovered that was just what it is, is this kind of, you know, I can do comedy, but it's always in the context of some kind of adventure or some kind of thriller. Right. You know, I, I did a rewriting of Don Quixote called Tilting at Windmills, right? It's an action adventure comedy like it's kind of one long junior high joke but it's a (laughs) but it's a you know what I mean so it's everything that I do came back to that same thing so I just eventually discovered this is my default this is my author Mm. voice so I need to just lean into that right Uh, so people that are deciding their genre like I I recently had someone like submitted to every category of a writing contest like nonfiction, fiction poetry everything and I'm like so what do you write? Like, what is your thing? Like, even my poetry has that dark underlying <laughs> theme. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's like everything is, there's a, there's a voice there. And that's helpful to develop a brand as you're going right. forward as well. But it was just, it was kind of a thing that just worked. And then because I loved research so much, I would research all these different things. Like, I know all these different ways to... Uh, just these various different ways to kill people and things like that. <laughs> to hide like, the body. You know, hide bodies, you know, stuff like that. So I'm like, it's no one kind of one to of check those your, things. Your Google search. <laughs> well, yeah, and like when you, it's at parties when somebody says, "Oh yeah, we'll see how they slit his throat there," and you're like, "No, that's actually not how that works." And then you explain it to them, and then they go, "I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna." <laughs> Over go here. over here <laughs> this is just like, i don't need to know <laughs> first of all i don't need to know that second of all how did you know that like <laughs> you know now that i hear it it makes sense but i didn't need to hear it <laughs> i don't actually want oh. to know this yes yeah so you know yes yeah i want to touch on one thing because i think it's interesting that you you first call yourself like mystery th- thriller writer and then you have other elements that you bring in. And I think that's not necessarily a mistake, but one thing that people might not really understand is you can be, you know, above all a romance writer. Maybe you always write, you know, something in which a relationship is happening. But if you're coming up against like uh, just writer's block, and like what do I write about this time? Like incorporating in another genre can really help your story because like you put a dead body in there and everything changes, right? Like you yeah. have this adventure, you know, some a balloon lands in the middle of your <laughs> a spy balloon gets shut down in your backyard. <laughs> everything changes, like trying that out. And what I find interesting, you were writing stories, you were putting in the words and then mm-hmm. you saw like what your voice is and then you move forward from there. So like putting words on paper in different ways is probably a really good way to go about finding your 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 pinpoint genre right like your niche genre and yeah I, I mean part of it is like being the other thing is being in touch with the short story market first of all you can make a little bit of money there you can't make a lot but you can't i shouldn't say that you can it's just a lot of hard work mm-hmm. but the short story market is a really interesting place to test out your ideas and test out your thoughts without having to write a full novel true like you, you go, okay, so what would happen with, I mean, think about like, we look at some classic TV sh- shows like Moonlighting. What is that? Well, it's a romance, 
with a lot of murder and dead bodies <laughs> and cases. And so it's, it's a romantic mystery type blend, right? right? But it works super well. So if you find yourself like, I feel like you're in a rut, like I'm, you know, I, I mean, if you're writing Regency romance, there's a limit to what you can throw in there, right? Um, there's a limit to what <laughs> readers are going to put up with. Regency fantasy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's there's kind of a readers are going to put up with a certain amount of like genre blending there, but not a lot. Not but a lot. If you're That's in true. almost any other romance genre, um, or if you just want to switch romance genres, I've I've talked to tons of people who've written historical romance or Regency romance and gone, you know what? I'm done, mm -hmm. right? With all the rules. I want to go play somewhere. Well, go write yourself a romantic comedy and throw in some jokes there and throw in some fun and see what happens, right? right. There's nothing wrong with like playing around within your genre as long as it somewhat resonates with your brand. And so that's a part of the thing too, is your brand as an author is you. Mm. It's not your series, not your books, not your character. Now this is for me. Some people will like, they focus on one series. That's their series forever or the same type of series, right? And that's what they do forever. And that's it, right? That's that's where they are, that's it. That's fine because that becomes their brand. But for okay. me, it should be more, your brand is you and who you are. Okay. And that's that's a persona that you put out in public too. You don't have to air all of your dirty laundry and tell the world all your secrets either, right? Um, in fact, please, please don't. don't. <laughs> um, but, yeah, but I mean, your brand is you, so you can, tell your readers hey man you like to laugh now some of your regency readers are not going to come over to that side mm. that's all right you're not always going to get crossover but you can get some so you're not starting from zero but there's nothing wrong with playing with your genre and exploring like who you are and what you yeah. want to do to have a sustainable author career you're going to have to add some variety over time you're right. going to have to find new and innovative ways to keep yourself interested right. in your work you yes. know so yes. <laughs> as well as your readers but i mean you have to be interested in it too otherwise your readers will notice if you... kind of what's the point yeah yes. your readers will notice they'll notice that you're you're mailing it in and they're it it's just not it's just not as good because you're not emotionally invested your reader is not emotionally invested right. so so how long have you been writing now so since really since 2009, really about 2011 2009. is when I went full time. So almost so, 15 years. Yeah. Yeah. At least uh, over a decade of full time. Right. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah. And things have changed quite a bit. I mean, you got in on that Kindle part, right? But, and I was talking with someone the other day, like lamenting a little bit, like, because I was around, I just had, you know, knee deep in diapers <laughs> with my kids at the time and wasn't very active in, in researching the market. Uh, kudos to you. Um, there is a certain point at which writers who were smart or just saw the market or were lucky or whatever it is, you know, and got in at that point, you know, she was saying, oh, they, they were so lucky. They really made their career at that point. And I said, yeah, but this is a career that every year you are having to put yourself out there and the good thing is that your books are evergreen they're always there you can keep pulling them out people are still going to find them a decade later but you have to put it out in front of them like they might have had a burst but <laughs> they still have to go out there they still have to tell new readers about their books right so it's it's still a full-time job correct or correct me yeah. if I'm wrong yeah no it's it's still a full-time job and for it to be sustainable you have to continue marketing like I have that original series that I wrote like I haven't updated the cover since 2013 I don't sell those oh, wow. books hardly at all well I need to bring them out redo the covers make them more relevant for today and read and it's one of my things on the agenda for this year right but just because you have a backlist mm. doesn't mean that you're it's not that those books never sell it's a, sometimes when they do i'm like oh man please don't read that um <laughs> but <laughs> you know that you know my writing has changed right and it's not that they're bad it's just that for me so i just have to get over that and bring them back into relevance right. in right. today's market um but you constantly have to do things like that you're constantly updating your books you're updating the back matter you're changing how you're doing business we're moving from 
from people being exclusively on Amazon to lots and lots of people selling books direct to readers through their right. own website. Right. Right. It's a great idea if you can make it work and develop that trust, right? And as Amazon and Facebook and all these other places go through all these changes, it's good to have your own place for people to come to so that yeah. you kind of own that. It's your territory. It's secure. It's your own thing, right? Right. Um, because before <laughs> we were very dependent upon yep. other markets and other people. And then, you know, things are constantly coming out, this whole AI thing um, and talking about like AI audio narrators and stuff right. like that and how people are, some people are extremely opposed, some people are extremely in favor. And then yesterday it comes out that a major audio book provider for indie authors basically has a clause in their contract that Apple can use your audio from your audio book to train AI narrator unless you opt out of it. Now, this is news yesterday. Right. Like the, the market has changed. So I have to decide, am I leaving my books on that platform? Right. And allowing, is that okay with me to allow that to happen? Right. Yeah. Well, so there's an immediate change in my, my career, my income, my next moves for right. my, my audio books. I mean, there's a, it changes everything. Yeah. Cause if in you decide to move <laughs> announcement, because yes. moving is a big deal. A big deal. Right. Yeah. And yeah. then you go, well, where do you move from there? Right. There are a limited number of options of people who have a good foothold in the market for audiobooks. Yeah. Right. Yep. So this is part of the like, this has nothing to do with writing, but it has everything to do with a writing career. Yes. That's everything turns on a dime. Yes. And and you're like, you know, so like I say, this is just it it's a part of this constant education and learning thing that's a part of an, an author career to have something sustainable for years. You aren't going to be Stephen King and release novels and finally get to a point where you just release one or two here and there and everybody's just waiting for whatever you release next. And truth is that isn't happening for him either. He has a huge marketing team and they're doing all kinds of things to bring his books out because yeah, he everything's has to. changing. Yeah, even he the traditionally published. Well, and they I think it was was it Jane Friedman? No, it wasn't Jane Friedman, but somebody the other day announced was wrote a whole article about even traditionally published. You have one book deal. Don't expect that they'll pick up your next book, even if it's nope. in the same series, the same genre. They, you're going to start all over no. again. Everything is changing. And as much as us writers only want to sit down and write, it's no longer viable. Like that's not going to no. be your life, right? Well, and think about what we saw, like when there was the big merger talk. Right. <laughs> and, and so there's these two publishers in front of Congress for three weeks. And what they told us, if you listen carefully, is we have no idea. No idea. <laughs> I was like, we don't know possible? how to sell books because here's what happens. OK, and they so you don't get know a, the market, which is amazing. you get a traditional publishing deal. Right. Yeah. You get your book to them and you're like, yay, my agent got this through an editor and I got published by a traditional publishing house. And I'm not selling any books. Yeah, well, and they because, know what they're doing, right? Wait. <laughs> yeah, like, nobody in their marketing department liked that book. And so right. if the marketing department doesn't like it, you aren't going to get the money and attention that you need yeah. to get your book anywhere in the charts. And it's going to sit and languish the same as somebody's self-published title they uploaded to Amazon last Thursday with no marketing. Right. Because right. the book that isn't marketed doesn't sell. And it doesn't matter what the publisher name on the spine is. Right. So, right, because they don't know your ideal reader, which is amazing to me. They don't. Oh no, they have no idea. It. They don't understand the all different subgenres that are happening. They don't understand social media. They they don't know, and you're not a big name. They they also said something like, "If you're not a big name, you're not going to sell." Like if they have that mindset, why even publish other people's books? You know, like what well, is going on? And like if you think about it, the only publishers that are like big publisher and they're not even traditional they're not even part of the big five is the ones that are owned by amazon yeah now why do those those you can do really well with those publishers if they like your book if the marketing right. department likes your book why amazon understands the subgenres. Mm -hmm. <laughs> amazon has all the data <laughs> yeah. on all the readers everywhere so they know exactly where to right. send your book so that people will buy it 
Yeah. Right. Now, can you learn those things on your own? And can you, yes, there are things you can do. Right. Yes. Right. So they're to help your career be sustainable, but anymore, you have to be thinking about those things as yeah. well as what you're writing. Yeah. So this, you know, I wrote a great book. Congratulations. Step one step of one, yep. many. Yeah. Whether you, you go know. indie or trad. You know. Whether you go into your trad, it's still the same thing. Yeah, you're still um, going to because be the way you're going to get the marketing department in the traditional publishers to notice your book is you're going to market it yourself until it sells a whole bunch of copies, and then somebody in the marketing department is going to go, "What's this book we published here? Oh, it actually is selling," and then they'll put their power. What do we do it. about it? Oh wait, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. What do we yeah. do about it now? Now that it's selling, yeah. and then they'll put their power behind it. Absolutely. But if they don't. If nobody notices it in their department, they're not going to put their power behind yeah. it. And you're going to be in the same boat as every indie publisher that's out there. Only when it comes to royalty time, you're getting 11% maybe yeah. of what the cover price is. And I'm getting 70. Yep. That's true. That's true. And, and if I'm selling them mind. through my website, I'm getting 100. Yes. Well, not 100, but Besides I'm getting those PayPal 5%. 85. I'm getting 85% maybe something like that. But you know what I mean? I mean, I'm yes. I'm I'm making money from my work. Yes, exactly. The the closest to 100% you can get. So so yeah. are are you you do a lot of things. You write, you're you're still writing your books. You help authors, you're um with Plotter as well. You are you are the guy that teaches us how to plot. Um so let's talk just as we wrap up a little bit about how you help authors. Are you are you still out there um, helping them edit and things like that? So I, I do editing. I don't do as much editing as I used to. So which, which means that I book like way, way out yeah. because I just. I can't do it as much. So I refer people to other editors in which general more more than I so what um, are your thoughts myself. on why we should use an editor? Because there's also a little bit of a trend in indies of, I don't need an editor. I know exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> so, well, so here's the deal. In indie publishing, let's say you use Pro Writing Aid and Autocrit or maybe Marlowe, whatever the latest thing is, right, to edit your book. Can you get it edited well enough for some readers? Sure. And if you're a skilled marketer, you can sell mediocre books and that's fine if that's what you want. That's that's not what I want. Um, and so you, there are certain steps you can take to work on editing your book so that costs you less for an editor, mm -hmm. but you need other human eyes on your book before it goes out into the world, regardless of what that looks like for you. And for me anymore, what I do when I do edit for people is I do an evaluation first, a manuscript okay. evaluation. And the reason is you will tell me all I need is a copy and line edit of your book. Yes. And <laughs> I will read your book <laughs> and I will go, nope. no, that's not what you need. Or I might say, yeah, that is what you need. And hey, that's great because I can do that one fast and I like right. that, right? Okay. That saves me all kinds of trouble and time, right? But for the most part, that rarely ever happens mm. usually you have some passive voice going on you have some showing or some telling not showing you have some all kinds of other stuff happening in your book that you don't see anymore because right. you're too close to it right. and so you need those other human eyes on your work um to make it better and don't go into marlowe and pro writing aid and all those things and just accept all the changes that they offer no please don't no. do that <laughs> because they're wrong Yes, they're wrong. They're going to put commas in the wrong place. They're going to substitute words that you did yes. not mean for it to substitute. And, yes. and it's going to read just like a machine, you know, it's edited going to read like AI, right? It's going to, it's it's, going to read terribly. It's yeah. horrible, you know, because even people are using AI heavily. And I know a lot of people that are using it. But even those that are using it heavily understand that the AI generates ideas, outlines, it helps you with certain types of writer's block or whatever, but you are still the yeah. writer. You still have right. to take what it spits out and make it into your story. Yeah, don't cut so, corners. You know, can it help you? Sure, sure. maybe. It, it can be, a, it, like any other tool, it can be a help, but like any other tool, it can also be your downfall. Mm -hmm. because when you start to trust a machine too much over your human instincts, your human emotions and stuff like that, just like with anything else, 
you're going to have problems. Nobody yet, even with Tesla's full self-driving mode, just goes back to make themselves a sandwich in the back seat while their car drives them around. Yes. Okay. <laughs> it, we're not there yet. Um, and a big part of the reason is that thinking and that decision making and that intent. Right. right. We're we're just not there yet, right? With machines. Right, right, right. Um, and hopefully by the time we do and they're sentient writing but, their novels, I'll be <laughs> well, at least they'll anyway. be able to keep us on the road. But I'm not sure they'll be able to still edit your book. What what I like about editing and working with an editor, and I tell everyone all the time, I know that it's an investment. It is, but it's cheaper than uh, going to back to college because it's really, and not that, you know, I have my own feelings about going to get an MBA and it's great for some people, but what you're doing is really looking at the story from the point of view of a reader, like fresh eyes and somebody especially who has um experience and understand storytelling and understands what should be happening you're getting a whole education like mm -hmm. right there you know it's really a relationship it is not meant to judge you it is meant for you to learn more and more and more and like you said there are times you might get to the point where all you need is a line edit because you understand and you can see the mistakes and you can follow through and that i mean maybe if you're smart enough that'll happen in a few edits I still really love to send off short stories and get feedback on them and pay for the editing and to see what they're seeing. Right. And I mean, if you, Joanna Penn, people who are up there are still working with editors. That's what I tell my, my writers. Yeah. It's, it's a hint. Like yes. you're, first of all, you're getting a lesson. You're getting a writing lesson every time because you're getting somebody else's perspective. There's also things that writers just do, right? Like you will repeat certain words and phrases in your book. Your editor will point that out. Yeah. You, your editor will point that out, right? And you go, oh man, I used some way too much. <laughs> or like, or like okay. I loved beautiful that day. I love like beautiful that day. Everything was beautiful. <laughs> everything was beautiful yeah, everything that was day. Beautiful. So you're like, in my next book, I am not going to repeat that word. I'm not going to do that again, right? And you're right. You won't. You won't. You'll just pick a different word and you'll repeat that one over and over throughout your book. And your next book, you'll pick a different one. And yeah. I mean, I'm telling you, 30 books in, I'm like, I have cycled through some words. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Sometimes I, I come them. back to one because I kind of like that one, apparently. Yeah. And I come back to it and repeat it again, right? And your editor catches those things and can tell you patterns can mm -hmm. tell you things that you're doing that you're like oh i didn't even realize right. i was doing that or i didn't right. realize i missed that until right. you said it and it's not something that an ai is going to catch it's not right. something that your editor and word is going to catch it's something that a human reader is going to yeah. catch and you need those eyes whatever yeah. that looks like for you you need those other eyes on yes. your manuscript yes absolutely so. I love that. So there, your um, website will be in the show notes below. It's TroyLambertWrites.com. Um, there's a lot more here on your website that we didn't even touch on. So I encourage everyone to go, go to TroyLambertWrites.com. You'll find out even more. You have some cool um, book trailers here as well, which we didn't even get into those. <laughs> those yeah, are those cool. are super fun. Super They're fun. very cool. So I'll have I'll have people go over there. But thank you so much, Troy, for coming and talking to me. I feel like we could we could talk for another three hours. But <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, we we could do several of these on different topics if we would stay on topic. If, if we, we, would, would stay we could if we could do that next you know, time, next time, next time, <laughs> next time we'll stay focused. Exactly. That's what I say every time. But exactly. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Troy. All right, thank you.